we are getting ready to discuss the great counterfactuals of the Civil War. The great what ifs. The great what ifs. They say, true historians, you know, pain historians, prudent historians don't get into alternate history, but we are not those historians. No, we're we are not just we are we are going to discuss we're, those questions that have always perplexed people. Yes, yes, we're the Indiana Jones of historians. We're out there on the fringes. There. Yes, yes, <laughs> we are wearing our silly hats. We are ready to discuss the hypotheticals of the yes. Civil War. So I have some questions. You have some questions that yes, you've received. Yes, thanks to everyone who submitted questions. So that makes this so much more interesting, so much more fun to get uh, everyone else's involvement. So thank and you. And if anybody has a question, um, feel free to put it in the comments here, and hopefully we will we will see it. Um, we're going to answer the the predetermined questions before, and then we'll, we'll then we'll take some more some more uh, live questions. So you want to go first. You want to start off? Well, I'll let's let's pick. Um, what if Hancock had fought for the Confederacy? This one, this one's kind of out there. Um, Hancock's a Pennsylvania man. I don't know if it was even a thought because he's he's professional army, like he's in the service at the time. Yes. I don't think there was even a chance, though. He is he's friends with with Armistead. Right. I, I learned that in the uh, the Supreme documentary, uh, Gettysburg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was all true. It's a great documentary. Great it was documentary. all true. There's nothing wrong in that. <laughs> I. Uh, it's funny that this question comes up because I was just watching Civil War Journal and I was on the episode of uh, Winfield uh, Sky Hancock and uh, no, I. I it's tough because he really the was superb. a Indian man through and through. I mean, yeah, absolutely. even a point where he gets accused or he's good friends with McClellan. McClellan is kicked out by Lincoln after Antietam. And he writes this article about how he doesn't necessarily agree what happened to his friend, but he wants everyone else to realize that they are serving a bigger cause and they're serving the country, hmm. you know, and that the, they are not just serving one man, one McClellan, they're serving... Uh, you know, the greater uh, US, uh, United States. So I really don't think that there was any inch of him that would have said, I'm no, the gray. No. no, no. Okay, you're, you go. You go. Next question. Okay, so the other one I've got here is from History Boy YouTube, um, who I've actually done an episode with. So thanks for tuning in uh, or submitting a question. Uh, if you if he's on here live, then he gets to see it. If not, I'm sure he can watch it later. But uh, he asks, what if Jackson was only a private, essentially? Do you want to start? Or <laughs> shall I go? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, if he was only a private, he's only a private. I mean, I, I'm sure okay. he knew how to load an, a musket and fire it. Uh, so all his experience, but. Uh... <laughs> so I have a lot of thoughts about Jackson. Okay, well. <laughs> and I have a lot of thoughts about how many thoughts people have about Jackson. <laughs> because he really is propped up as St. Thomas. I mean, he is. He is. It, because of the few minor victories he has, and because of the mythos that was created even at the time. Right. Um, I always go back to Fremantle because he's an independent observer. He talks about how everyone absolutely worships Jackson. Uh, and that everyone's completely distraught that he's gone. Um, I, the thing that was very frustrating for me, and we've mentioned it before, when I was doing the Overland campaign trip uh, to, to film a bunch of stuff for the Overland campaign, we would be in Virginia. You know, the Overland kind of overlaps with the Chancellorsville campaign. And you'll be in... Uh, you know, a site for wilderness and you'll see stuff for Spotsylvania for, for I mean, for uh, Chancellorsville. Um, and so we saw, you know, I'd be, we'd be at Grant's headquarters and the bigger sign is for, you know, where Jackson's arm is buried and, you know, where, where Jackson's arm was amputated and where Jackson got shot. 
and where Jackson had some coffee once and right, where right. Jackson, you know, where Jackson set up his tent once and it's just Jackson, Jackson, Jackson. So um, that in itself is a discussion worth having, just the fact that the, the Jackson mythos has been built up, built up. But I don't particularly think he, you know, is a game changer for a lot of battles. I mean, they always say, you know, what if Jackson was at... Um, Jackson was at Gettysburg. That's one core commander. You know, right. at the end of the day, he's he was a you know a great tactician. He's not changing the grand strategy of the campaign. Right. Um, that's 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 what I have about Jackson. Because I also got a Jackson. What if at the Battle of Kernstown, Jackson's reserves would have made it in time? Um. I have a similar, you know, that's, that's basically the same I mean, answer. It, essentially, yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, even if you look at First Manassas, First Bull Run, where they talk about him, you know, where he gets the title Stonewall, uh, there's going to be a lot of South Carolinians who disagree with that because yeah. if you look at that dispute, they say that they were moving to support Jackson, who was standing like a dumb stone wall and yeah. not moving, you know? Um, who was doing nothing when something had to be done. So, again, like, it, there's a lot of mytho uh, mythos around him and stuff, but I, I, I don't, it's not for me. I'm not a Stonewall Jackson fan. I am not a Jackson fan. Sorry to all yeah. of our Jackson fans I, I out there. I apologize. <laughs> um, so now it's me. Albert Sidney Johnston survives. That's a good one. Yes. Um, and it's finally the Western Theater. Amazing. Yeah. Yes. Actually, yes. We should take the lead on this because you just did. And awesome yeah. So and Albert Sidney Johnston, the the key with Shiloh is the fact that he dies in the middle of the battle. Right. You know, when when your army commander dies in the middle of the battle, that's obviously going to have a big effect on things. And he was managing crisis to crisis as he goes. Uh, but I don't know if if he survived, if he, um, you know, not only survived the battle, but survived that um, to, to fight another day, whether that would have changed the outcome of the campaign. Because again, the Western theater is about the grind of logistics, right? Moving right. to the next, moving to the next step, taking the next railroad junction, taking the next landing along the Mississippi and moving up men and material. Right. And Shiloh was a meeting engagement while they were moving towards Corinth. Right. It wasn't, uh, you know, Johnston was brilliant for moving out and hitting the army when they did not expect it, but I don't think that would have changed the the circumstances of the whole campaign. I know they talk about him having this stellar uh, record previously to the Civil War, serving yeah. the Texan army and stuff like that. I don't even know the the story behind that, though, I know he was part of a duel that I think he lost, but I don't know. He's one of the most like experienced actually. soldiers in the army at the yeah. time. So right, right. I think he's experienced, but I don't recall anyone, at least in, I could be getting this wrong, but I don't remember reading anything about any significant major changes he did to the Texan army to help it win the war. I don't know I, I, like, where that comes from, the, the stellar record. Well, he he but, had he had a good record in Mexico. He had a good record in okay, just a in solid Texas. Record, solid he's guy. he's okay. yeah, and he's been in a long time. He's been uh, yeah, he knows his yeah, stuff. He, people yeah. people know who he is. Okay, um, and it's just disappointing. Um, yeah. But anyway, that's that's Albert Sidney Johnston. Your your turn. Ah, um, the next one. Well, this kind of goes with yours from the country lawyer T N. I'm assuming Tennessee. Grant totally defeated at Shiloh. What from the wait, if what? Grant from had, the if, if uh, this is from country lawyer Tennessee or T N. Oh, okay. Um, and he's asking what would have happened if Grant had totally been defeated at Shiloh. Well, it's this. This is a really good question yeah. um, because again, it's it the the movement down towards Shiloh is is the grind of the union moving forward. It's if Sherman, it's it, the question is, would Sherman have been defeated at Shiloh and forced to withdraw or been captured 
um, that means that all of the other core, the, or all the other divisions, because again, this is pre-core uh, system, um, were moving, then, you know, if, if they didn't intercept the army, if they didn't come up to support Sherman, you know, you would have, yeah, it, it would have been a, a bad loss. Um, but I don't think it would have stopped the entire campaign. The, no, the point I, I of think, Shiloh, or, yeah. yeah. No, I think Grant definitely is one of those hard chargers. And we've seen Grant, I mean, if you just look at the Civil War, Grant is constantly bumping into obstacles. Even yeah. if he loses one battle, even if he loses a skirmish, he still pushes forward. I mean, did, is it Sherman who said of him that he, he looks like he has that face that, you know, he, would, he wants to stare through a brick wall and go through it or oh, something. Oh, that's, like that's that. when he's walking. Right, right. When he, he, he moves like he's walking through a brick wall. Yeah, about yeah. To walk he, through a brick he wall. has this demeanor of he's just going to push through you no matter what. And, and, and I think even if there was a total defeat at Shiloh, yes, people would have been uh, yelling at him. I mean, he won at Shiloh and he still got flack for it. He was, well, that's he what lost, I was about to say. He flack for it. When, uh, and, in in period, they... Yeah. It was. It did not make the Union Army look good, because no. they were taken unawares. They they survived to fight another day. You know, Grant the... says, "Lick them tomorrow." Right. You know, Sherman comes to Grant expecting to be chastised, and he says, "Lick them tomorrow." Right. But um, I just so... don't think that Grant is the type of guy to let one defeat. Throw oh him. no. No. If so. if if Sherman was complete, if if Sherman was captured, or that entire army was defeated. That would just be, you know, back to square one. We still have Donaldson. Now we're, you right. know, slowly moving forward. Or they would have, you know, moved up the Cumberland, right? Instead of instead of down down the Tennessee. So, um, that's Shiloh. Shiloh, yeah, yeah. What if the Union Army didn't discover Lee's plans prior to Antietam? This one's you, Eastern Theater. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. What if, Though my dog uh, is named Antietam, so I should be an Antietam expert. So, so he's asked, what was the question? If the orders So if, if, if they didn't find the, uh, the plans wrapped in the cigar there. Well, you know, McClellan makes this big deal of that, you know, he was going to totally route Lee's army with those plans. And I mean, it's kind of a, a draw in the end. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I don't know. I, maybe it was like, I think people make a big deal of the orders. Uh, I think it's always great to have great intelligence, especially if you have it written in someone else's hand. Um, but by the time the armies are engaged, I'm not sure if it made a difference tactically at the time when they're engaged. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, if Lee uh, didn't, if Lee had, you know, more time to move further into Maryland, the, the engagement would have happened somewhere else. Um, yeah. Or the Union would have looked worse, and maybe maybe Lincoln wouldn't have had as much political clout. Um, you know, maybe the Emancipation Proclamation gets moved back. Moved back. A uh, little there, bit. Yeah. There's a lot of things that could have happened if yeah. Antietam went very very poorly. But I don't right. think if I don't think Lee had this magical solution that if he you know did this invasion in secret that he would have um, right done much better um but yeah and, and that was just the thing i'm going off of is that you know does the do the orders help mcclellan out and in, in the beginning sure but once he meets lee tactically i think he does the best he can but at that point you know those orders yeah. don't help him once he's you know head to head with lee and he's yeah. got to figure that one out so and um Dan, Dan Wayne says uh, uh, Little Mac wouldn't have moved as quickly to meet Lee at Antietam. Yeah, that's true. I mean, if he, he would yeah. have been able to choose his own ground. That, right. that would yes. have been yeah. that would have been the that, thing, and 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 that, and, and that yeah. could have caused yes, you know, more egg on the uh, the Union face. But uh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. But again, I am a Little Mac fan. He he <laughs> is absolutely through and through a professional. And at the grand strategy level, he definitely knows what he's doing. I think the Peninsula yeah. Campaign is a brilliant um, replication of the Crimean War, um, and it had complications. Um, and most of those complications come in actually moving it in towards Richmond, yeah. of course. But logistically, it is just 
profound it is. Well, I would say that uh, if you look at McClellan, he reorganizes the army twice yeah. after defeat, um, which is a major, major thing, uh, especially coming out of two defeats at, at the same battlefield of yeah. Manassas. You know, he, he kind of has to redo the miracle that he does at first Manassas, again, at yeah. second Manassas, or first bull run and second bull run. Yeah. So he really does reorganize the army and he puts a lot of professionals in places that they can actually make a difference. You know, there are a lot of professional appointments that he makes. Yes, a lot of the New York volunteers, a lot of the militia guys didn't necessarily like those appointments. You know, the 79th yeah. New York did mutiny <laughs> over Stevens. But yeah. there's no doubt that later in the war that the 79th learned that having a guy like Stevens, who's a regular army guy, is a major asset when you're actually trained to fight a real war and not a 90-day picnic. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, McClellan does a great job with that. He's, he's a great organizer and, you know, he gets a lot of flack. But I always say this about McClellan, if he was so bad, why is it that the soldiers all love him? I mean, if if really anybody's interested in the McClellan uh, backstory, I did a, a really long video with my friend Brett on uh, um, our FTG channel uh, about McClellan in the Crimea when he was a captain and what he learned and what he didn't learn uh, when he was uh, observing yes. the Crimea more. Well, that was interesting because you talked about how he was looking at things from the, his level. Of yeah. He right. he was reporting no. as a cavalry captain. A cavalry and captain. So we can't we can't get mad at him that he's he's not you know looking at trains and, and looking at uh, you know army level logistics. He's worried about uh, the the measurement for bunks and the shape of the saddle. So. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that's what a cavalry captain would have been interested in. You know. That's what they would have been interested in. I'm sure if you got an uh, infantry captain, he would have been very much interested in the uh, firearms and stuff like that. So, yeah. you know, that's just the level he was at. All right, your turn. Okay, let's see this one. Again, this is from Country Lawyer Tennessee, TN. What if Jubal Early took Washington? Took Washington. Took Washington. He just, he, he just rides on his magical scent. <laughs> he, he just he's, he's, uh, just flies in over Fort Stevens, just knocks away the 300 pound parrots with his fist. Yes, yes. Yes. And then he, and then he sits in the White House and- uh, And, and St. Jackson illuminates the way for him. St. <laughs> Jackson looking down just yeah. uh, like allows him to see through the dark as he's punching yes. those uh, those 300 pound parrots out of the way. St. Jackson gives him the strength to knock those yeah. parrots down. I, I, pe uh, I think people um, would be shocked at the actual defenses of Washington, even when they're scaled back for the Overland campaign. It, there was it, a lot. Is, yeah. They, uh, especially with Congress is. and, uh, you know, everyone was saying we need to defend the Capitol and everyone knew the Capitol's right there. Right. right across the border. So the the defenses are very interesting. And even on Instagram, you can see Civil War Defenses of Washington and uh, uh, Major General Stephen Pham. You go to uh, uh, his yep. account and you can see him talk about the defenses of Washington. Really interesting uh, National Park Ranger, very knowledgeable. Um, but the defenses of Washington were formidable. It would have, again, it would have made people look bad, would have maybe interrupted logistics for a day. Um, could have gone really poorly, could have swayed public opinion, but he's not going to take Washington with his fists. No, no. Uh, those fortifications being built, I mean, they were built when the, you know, 90 day volunteers came in, uh, in 1861 and they're, they're being built and they keep adding on and adding on and adding yeah. on by the time early gets there. I mean, this is a real fortification. This is yeah. no joke. And, and, and really yeah. heavy artillery, like light artillery, but right. also, you know, there there are 300 pound parrot guns. So you're not able to bring up artillery right. uh, of your own. Because and, 
and Early had been fighting his way up there. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if he had enough guys with enough energy even to attempt like a full on scale, you know, scale the bastions and, no. you know, I, I don't think he would have had that ability. The best to hope for was disruption of supplies and public right. opinion. Right. But and, again, and, and, you know, I will always talk about with the Overland at least, the, the machine of war for the North is incredible. Just the the logistics of the the uh, the roads and the rail and the steam or the steamboats are all just incredible. Uh, if you if you look at the numbers of how much stuff is get, uh, getting unloaded at City Point every day for the siege of Petersburg, it's incredible. And I, I I'm doing a video on it coming up. We filmed it, but I again I'm, I'm the worst editor very slow, but I'm doing a video on the U.S. Army Bakery, and that seems really innocuous, but the, the U.S. Army Bakery at City Point um, was able to bake hot bread for men in the field. Wow. And, you know, they were, they were cranking out like 75,000 rations a day at this one site, and they claimed to be able to get hot bread to men in the field. And when the other side is starving what a game changer that is what oh, a yeah. different situation they're living in yeah so i'm actually reading the book uh seizing a uh, seizing destiny mm. uh it's by uh let's see chris uh Mikowski, of course and uh, but he he co-authored it uh with uh, albert connor i have it here and they just talk about the reorganization of the army after uh fredericksburg I think it's like 96 days where the army is reformed. And what's that called and again? It's called Seizing Destiny. I think it's okay. like the Army of Potomac's um, Valley Forge. And the troops actually called it their Valley Forge. It was that winter period uh, right after Fredericksburg. And it really does show, it's interesting to read it because most people, when they read about the Civil War or any military history, we love to focus on the battles. We love to refight the battles, which is why we're yeah. here discussing this. But we don't realize that some of the biggest successes is literally just moving people from one Stuff. place to another, feeding them, clothing them. Like that is a huge deal when it comes to how you're gonna wage a campaign. I, I yeah. wanna read that because it, I, I read, last year I read The Quartermaster. Okay. It was about Miggs, um, Montgomery Miggs, and his, you know, changing of the way the army worked, or the army quartermaster worked, and it, it profound. And, yeah. and <laughs> it's yeah. funny how many problems were involved, not just with the the regular problems, but there was also corruption. There were there was also oh, problems yeah. with uh, contracts, of course. Oh, contracts! It was, it was mean, a nightmare. Who was this uh, Simon Cameron? Right. Yeah. Uh, he was known to be very corrupt. Yeah. And I think there's a quote alleged to him that he said, the only honest politician is one who stays loyal when bought, <laughs> which is one of my favorites from him. Um, but that was the thing. There's a lot of corruption. And, of course, the supply guys, they always get a lot of flack for, oh, well, you know, we just never believed in repeaters. That's the only thing I hear about from the supply side, right? That everyone just hates on them because they never- Well, like yeah, and that's, that's the ordinance. That's yeah, right, that's, the that's, ordinance. Rip, yeah, that's Ripley. Yeah. Ripley, And if yes. you go to my friend Brett's channel, Paper Cartridges, he's gone into um, why they didn't adopt repeaters yes. and, yes. and what, what that was, because it really wasn't uh, as simple as just just get repeaters. Right, they exactly. had They had shorter range, um, they were they were finicky. They yep. had not figured that out, and they needed to do it in a massive scale. Right, right. So. And that's that's the art of it of finding out how do we get a working weapon to thousands of guys. How do we feed them, clothe them, yeah. so that for that one time when they actually engage the enemy, which is you know, only a small percent of, of actual campaigning, right? Yeah. That one moment when it matters, when they engage the enemy, that everything is 
working in their favor to make them more lethal. Uh, you know, so yeah, so, so uh, man, my next deal. one comes from Peninsula Wars and it is engineers. Just says engineers. Engineers. I the like talking about like engineers. It was my first Civil War impression. I ah. I, I did uh, Union Engineers because no one had done Union Engineers yet, and I uh, and their branch color was yellow, which is really cool. It's uh, everyone thought we were cavalry, <laughs> but uh, it, it's it's a really interesting um, history, um, and it's really cool to portray. There are some great engineer units on the East Coast. They even do. Uh, the pontoon bridges at Fredericksburg. Wow, that's. Um, <laughs> but but it's if you want to get see some interesting living history, the engineer units always have have oh, great uh, stuff. Didn't they, weren't the engineers considered like the premier branch? Like if you were an officer, yeah, you I mean got th that's one thing that we always talk about when it comes to the uh, the West Pointers that the mm -hmm. the the great uh, officers come from the engineers. Um, the, the, but you can you can take that on a case by case basis. Who the different uh, um, what branches each of these people started in? I think it's a yeah. really interesting thing to consider. And when we were at uh, Chattanooga, we actually looked up Thomas. Uh, started out as an artillery officer, ended up being the cavalry instructor at West Point, and so we thought that that might have influenced how he acted. Mm -hmm. um, Grant started in the infantry, but then he immediately, for Mexico, they needed him in the quartermaster. So he's right. thinking like a quartermaster yes. often. He's I, yeah. just, we need the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And when he crosses the Mississippi below Vicksburg, he says, you know, bring coffee, sugar, and bacon. That's it. You get that stuff across, we're good. Mm -hmm. We'll worry about the other stuff later. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, profoundly interesting to me that he's he's this got that background yeah but yeah, yeah. the engineer is very well, very well, important well-rounded officer um let's see your turn uh, for one i have ah yes yeah, so peninsula wars and birds of a feather zero zero ask about the elephants let's talk elephants elephants if lincoln had accepted so tell, tell us the story of the elephants <laughs> Well, essentially what happens is uh, the King of Siam offers Lincoln uh, elephants for the, for the, for the fight. Uh, and I think he sends Lincoln a, a picture of himself, which I guess is very com a common gift, okay. right? And uh, something else, I'm not sure. I'd have to double check. But Lincoln writes a very nice letter or actually has someone write it for him. I don't know. But it's a very nice letter explaining that, you know, steam and the railroad is really how we move things in the U.S. and that the climate would just be too poor for the elephants. And so he denies the gift of elephants. So sad. Uh, unfortunately, so sad. I... <laughs> but if they came over, how would they be used? That's we got to answer the question. Yes. If if they came over, you know, first of all, the first thing I thought of, if they come over, they've probably got to be like real war elephants in the past, right? So they probably are wearing the armor because there was sort well, of bulletproof armor that people wore back then. Very rare, wasn't. They use sure they... The, the, the experience that I know with them yeah. is in the Anglo-Burmese War. Yeah. So when the British invade Burma um, in the 18... 30s or 40s, um, they um, had what are essentially wall guns mounted on them, large, guns, not yeah. quite cannon, but not no, quite no. just musket. It's just like mega musket yeah, um, mounted on top of them. Uh, and so they, they, they used them like that. I don't know whether they would have used them with the armor charging in. Well, you and know, it I, was seems thought, like, I thought we should go all the way. I was like, it seems like that's how the, how the, the Thai used them too. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. But, you know, the real answer is the boring answer. Which, oh. And Peninsula Wars just said it. They would have been pack animals. Ah, uh, yeah. They yeah. really, I mean, because not everything runs on the railroad. Absolutely. And, you know, no, once it, it gets to the been, depot, it has been, to come off the depot. Yeah. And they would have been great pack animals. Um, yeah, I mean, it, you, 
I'm sure in the, in the, the camel episode, you talked about um, old Douglas. Well, yeah, old Douglas was used by as a band. Pack animal, essentially, he, he was moving the band's equipment. Yeah. So I think, yeah, definitely the elephants probably more than likely would have been used as pack animals. That's correct. But they um, would have been, yeah, Dan's got it. It's, uh, they would although, not have done well I against mean, a rifled parrot gun. I mean, the elephants with, you know, the Wolverines, Custer's Wolverines at Gettysburg charging. I mean, that could have been a game changer. And, you know, Maybe. The, the, the horses, I think they would have been a light cavalry, best. heavy the cavalry mount. and very heavy cavalry. Yes. Yes. You know, oh, very well, heavy I, cavalry. You know, Lincoln just, he wasn't a visionary. No, <laughs> I know. If only they brought over the elephants, only, everything would have been only. fine. The war no. would have been over by Christmas. Oh, it would have, well, it would have taken until Christmas to get them there. But yeah. I know. <laughs> wow. But uh, yeah, well, no, that was yeah, a good one. Pack animals. That was a great one. Um, and then Barney, uh, Bar uh, Barnum and Bailey, they would have, we would have taken them after the war. Yes. You know? Yes. There you go. Absolutely. So I have one that is a big one, and I'm not going to answer most of it. I'm going to refer them to uh, one of our first episodes and everything else oh, that I talk this? about. But I have a question that says, what if Britain got involved? That is a book oh, that yeah. could be this big. Yeah, yeah. That is, yeah. that is the ultimate question. That is my favorite question. I'm glad I did not plant that. <laughs> but... Uh, there would have been so many different circumstances that had to be involved because, again, Britain would – a lot of things would have had to ch to change in order for Britain to agree to support a confederacy with slavery. You know, after, after uh, you know, abolishing the slave trade, abolishing the institution of slavery, aggressively pursuing an, uh, abolition treaties all around the world – um, aggressively uh, attacking the, the slavers along the African coast, that's, uh, it, would be, it would be counterintuitive for them to have um, uh, yeah. supported I, the, 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 the Confederacy. Where and is uh, you, the, uh, the famous, I want to say, uh, cotton, cotton mill? Is it in Lancashire, Lancashire that even so the Lancashire Lincoln. cotton famine yeah. happens when uh, the South or well, the blockade first the South cuts off cotton then there's the blockade it's both both things um, when the cotton runs out in Lancashire people people starve in um, you know the working class suffers because yeah. of that there is a depression in Manchester um, because the cotton runs out but they know, and Lincoln writes to them during the war, they know they are doing their part to contribute to the death of slavery. Before, before the, Lincoln's even, before mm -hmm. people are even honest about what the Civil War is about um, in, in the North, the uh, uh, people know that that's what they're doing. And that's one of the concepts that's very interesting about um, Britain and the Civil War is the the lower classes do tend to support the South or the North, and there are sympathizers in the upper class um, that that uh, see that romantic view of the American South. But um, where was I going with this? Oh, the but Lancashire the, the Cotton family. But yeah, Lincoln actually writes to them and thanks yeah. them for their part in that. And there's a there's a statue of Lincoln today there. And but I, I um, think that just shows that even though these people are sort of out of work, essentially, they still believe in that abolitionist cause. Yeah. And they're okay with it. They're, well, you know, it's for, and, and then Britain goes to Egypt anyway. And, but uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. They go and get uh, cotton from India, cotton from Egypt. Yeah. But if something happened and they did intervene, or if, um, Britain, you know, forced a peace <laughs> right. um, or did some sort of action. I mean, the Trent Affair, we do actually come close. When, yeah. when we see, when the U.S. seizes a British steamer 
and takes the Confederate um, uh, agents off of it, that is nearly an act of war to the British and they, they do deliver terms. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do actually come close to a third Anglo-American war. I think it would have gone very poorly for the US because the, the British professional army is just leaps and bounds above the US. Mm -hmm. um, it would have had the support of the French most likely. So it would have been fighting Britain and France. France, yeah. Um, there was an understanding with Napoleon III, though we also think that Napoleon might have also supported. Um, yeah, we do think Napoleon would have gone um, for the Confederacy, especially because he's starting to do things in Mexico. Mexico, right. Um, but then again, then we also have warrior just on the on the uh, yeah. ocean, iron hulled battleships basically are up would be operating in New York Harbor. You know, you got the only thing that would stop that is a very quick uh, building of a bunch of seacoast rifled guns right. um, by the by the U.S., which would have happened um, to quickly combat a lot of those iron ships. But in those early days, professional British army moving down from Canada and um, the, the British blockade and would have been just would watching have been uh, some of the videos that uh, your buddy Brett, right? Brett does. Yeah. And, and as well as you talking about the professional British army, especially in the, versus the early days of yeah. the Union army. I mean, the, the the Brits were professionals. They knew yeah. their weapons. In, like, the average infantry... And even our professional weapons. army was not yeah. professional. Yeah. In in terms of in terms of musketry. Right, um, right. The, the British army spent a lot of time and resources in making sure that each, sure. Yes. each soldier that handled that brand new rifle musket yes. knew what to do with it. Right. And right. for a lot of Civil War soldiers, it's tragic that the first time they fire a rifle is in combat. In combat. A under fire. huge amount Absolutely. of them. And that's a huge difference. I yeah, think. because it's now now your individual soldier knows, knows how to measure distance, yep. knows how to calculate his trajectory. He's going to be able to put fire down a thousand yards away. He's right. going to be able to fire against artillery. And, and that's what we talk you. about in our balaclava thing. And yeah. what Brett writes about in his book, The Destroying Angel, is in the Crimean War, at Balaclava, infantry countered infantry. It made sure that the infantry couldn't advance. Infantry countered cavalry. When they, the thin red line stopped yes. the, uh, the charge of the uh, Russian cavalry, and infantry countered artillery when uh, Lieutenant Godfrey uh, fired with a small, small rifle party, fired against Russian artillery and forced the artillery battery to withdraw with his musket. So, so that's that's a huge difference. That's just yeah. a huge difference right there. Uh, and yeah. I understand I'm a little biased, but I don't think it would have gone well. No, no. <laughs> no, I, I think it would have been, it would have been rough. It would have been rough. Would have been rough. It would have been rough to say the least. And it just would have been no contest on the ocean. Just, just. No well, the, yeah, that's. Yeah. No contest. No contest. Not even a, they, not they, even a it's a joke. Ways. <laughs> okay, next question. Next question. Let's That's see. You. Uh, did that one. So here's one from a buddy of mine. I actually know per uh, personally, John Anthony, 1995. Uh, thanks for submitting the question. What if the South was able to consistently cut off Union supply? Consistently. Well... I am going to I'm going to start with that one because the 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 union war machine is all about logistics and it's all yeah. about capturing each of those supply points as they move forward. So I don't know how that would have happened. There it's, I mean the only thing I could think of was like the small raids that the yeah. Confederacy does, but the key word here I think is consistent. And those are not consistent. You know, every now yeah. and then you get Mosby riding around doing his thing. Jeb Stewart does his thing. But I just don't think that that was consistent enough. Yeah. Uh, heck, even Hampton steals a bunch of beef uh, at Petersburg. And still, that's just not enough to uh, slow the war machine. Yeah. 
No, uh, and and my friend Dan does bring up a point, and depends on when. And Brett and I are doing a follow up video about this, about the Third Anglo American War potentially. Is I do talk about the war machine fighting the U.S. when they are ready in 1864 or five would have been different than fighting in 1862. Well, yes. yes. And and it would have. I think it would have resulted in either a negotiated peace or or some sort of uh, um, you know Wait, long this is in drawn out to campaign. To oh Obama? yeah, I'm backing up and talking about the British oh, again. Okay, okay, right, um, right, okay. It, the uh, if if they fought in 1864, it would not have been cut and dry. If they no. if they fought in 1862, it done, done. Yes. But yes. in 1864. It would have taken a long time. It would have been a difficult war. But right, again, it right. would have involved both Britain and France. And it would have been... Um, I don't think it would have been uh, easy. Uh, it, but no. in 1864, the, arm, the Union Army was a well-oiled machine. Oh, yeah. And uh, Whether or not they can fire out to 800 yards. Whether or not. Whether or not. <laughs> well, They're they going to close they the distance. Stand, right? They can stand. Can yeah, stand, I mean, and, right? and that is the French doctrine. The French doctrine right. is close the distance with the bayonet, and it works. Yeah. At Solferino, they charge Austrian batteries and take them with the bayonet without firing a shot. They're right. cool. And that's, yeah. those are the, that's why there are Zouave units, because the French, they just, they vault over a wall. Yeah. They vault over walls with their bayonets, and yeah. they stab you. Yeah. Like, of course, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the yeah, British yeah. are a little more methodical. They're a little more professional. Little, they get yeah. the, but for some reason, the French Elan works for a while. For a while, yeah. For a while, and then the Austrians are like, you know what? That's cool. And then they learn all the wrong lessons from that in 1866. But that's a different day. That's a whole. <laughs> that's a whole different day. <laughs> but, so anyway, but that is true. back I, to I our agree. logistics question. Yeah, but I do agree with. Um that it does depend when and in yeah. 1864 you could argue i mean th with what the union army and the the union navy was doing it, it was pretty formidable pretty well yeah. oiled it kind of had but it. but galena you know any any union ironclad that's being being produced is yeah. not going to stand up to anything close to warrior right like just just <laughs> I mean, they're, 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 they're river monitors. They're, they're yeah. not, they're not no, meant no, to, they're not. to actually they're fight. And that's what happens to like the original monitor, right? It, yeah. It thinks on well, the Oconus Yeah. Front. Yeah. It, it, a monitor probably would have operated with the support of uh, coastal artillery. Yes. So yeah. maybe it could take on, uh, <laughs> it could take on um, warrior if it was hiding under the guns of Fortress Monroe. But right. Other than that, but but you know no. you know the, but the sun has to be a certain way the ocean has to be a certain yeah. you know temperature you know yeah. everything has to line up for that to kind yeah. of work out. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so we answer, we kind of answered our you know what if what if the what if St. Jackson came down and made it so there was no food for the Union Army then ever. the Union Army would starve. <laughs> well, that's. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to uh, answer, you know, hard to disagree with that one. I mean, that's what I, you said. Yes, yes. <laughs> but I think it would have been very difficult to disrupt supply chains in either theater. Right, so. right, right. And, you know, like I said before, I think you do see Confederate cavalry, Confederate rangers, a few partisans here and there attempt to do their thing. Yeah. But and they do it successfully, but yeah. it's just not on such a massive scale and a consistency that is going to slow down that machine. Uh, I mean, Mosby's is, dangerous, mm -hmm. but Mosby terrorizes people. Mm -hmm. He doesn't necessarily, you know, cut off the supplies for an entire army. Right, right, and you know, it, and and you said it, you said it. He terrorizes people, so you know, guys who are de defending the supply train, they might be nervous about oh, Mosby, he might he might be around any corner, you know. He might, but, you know, he when he still comes be. by, he, he steals a couple boxes of hardtack and leaves. Well, the Union Army is just going to ship more hardtack down there. That's kind of what they're going to do. That's not, not a huge deal. So, so um, next question. That's, is it, it's you. Is it me or you? Uh, I think I'm, that's all my questions. Okay, so, I got a big one. The reason okay. why I'm wearing my silly hat. Ah, I'm yes. wearing my 
my reproduction of uh, um, the the of Garibaldi's smoking cap, which I I have available for anyone that wants it. Send me a message. Um, <laughs> what if Garibaldi had accepted a union offer of command? Wow. And so the telling the story, the backstory is that uh, Giuseppe Garibaldi was one of was an adventurer and general and had fought in uh, South America. He was the uh, the liberator of Uruguay. He had fought in uh, multiple revolutions in Italy and had just successfully l led the expedition of the Thousand, um, starting in Sicily, moving into um, Calabria and Naples and basically doing the second half of the unification of Italy. He was a celebrity general and um, he had done a lot with a little multiple times in his life and had gained great notoriety for that. And he um, offered his services to the United States but he wanted a couple things. He, there had been uh, correspondence back and forth and he wanted a couple of things. He wanted to be in complete command, um, which I don't think would have happened. No. Um, it, that's that one, number one, that's not gonna happen. So maybe they might've given him an independent command or maybe given him a theater, but he would not have, I, I don't think that would have happened. So political. But yeah. the other thing, was he wanted the, it to be, he basically wanted the Emancipation Proclamation now. He basically said Lincoln needs to come out and say this is about slavery. Um, and and he would, so, he, because I think he, yeah. uh, let me start by saying, I think he wanted to um, do a lot with a little like he had before. And he wanted to, use his celebrity, use the cause to, to drive a lot of his, uh, his efforts. I think he right. wanted to get the, the average person, maybe even get um, a lot of the enslaved people involved um, in, in the fight, because that's well, what he that's had always his, done. He's a, he's a revolutionary. Like, he yeah, that's what he had always done. I think he would have, yeah. I think he would have wanted to go into Port Royal with, you know, a thousand guys go deep into Confederate territory and, and uh, start, start a uh, slave rebellion. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that might that be one way of doing thing. it. Yeah. Um, that would have been his thing for sure. Yeah. Or if he got Supreme command, he might've um, been a little more aggressive. I think if he got put in command of the army of the Potomac, he would have been an aggressive commander. Um, well, I know one of the things they were talking about, about why he would, why having him would be a good idea uh, from Lincoln's standpoint and the Union standpoint is that they just thought because of his celebrity status, <laughs> he'd be able to enlist a lot of people. You know, people would. Oh hear, yeah. Oh, it's Garibaldi. I didn't well, even think. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and right. I think absolutely. I think he would. Yeah. Have done that. I think definitely a lot of people would have. A lot of people thought that if. A lot there. of people thought yeah. that if that happened, volunteers would come from Europe. Oh yeah. Like from yeah. all over. Right. Right. And I'm uh, sure that. Uh, he had a lot of people who had served with him in previous wars that we've talked about in an episode, if anyone wants to watch uh, yes. Soldiers of Fortune, um, who would have come and said, hey, we're here for the ride again. Let's do this. Round three. <laughs> you know. So absolutely, I think that would have been a game changer. But again, he's a follower of the French doctrine. He's a... Uh, yes. He's a close the distance with the bayonet. Um, he's not a a professional in the British sense. Um, he's not a logistics guy. He is a live off the land sort of guy. Um, I don't know whether a lot of those revolutionary skills would have translated, but that's probably right. the biggest thing is just the charisma. Yeah. Right. I mean, he, he's that's a cool best. guy. I, I would have wanted to follow him. Yeah. But I don't, like you were saying before, as far as like, on the tactical professional tactical standpoint, I don't know if he would do much else with this giant volunteer union army. Yeah. Um, but it is yeah, cool. We at least got the Garibaldi guard, even though yeah, it's mostly yes, Hungarians. Yes, we did. We, and that unit was made up of people from all over too. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of Hungarians, a lot of Germans. Um, yeah. I think it's funny that there are a lot of, um, 
northern Italians in the Garibaldi Guard, and then a lot of uh, southern Italians, the old Bourbon prisoners down in uh, um, um, down in Louisiana. Right. Yeah. So a lot, wheat, wheat has a uh, lot of them, brings a lot of them or, home because wheat. Or I, I learned recently, it's not uh, wheat's tigers; it's white's tigers. Yes. That's what I learned recently. Yes. Uh, but uh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Uh, and I think the Percy, most... old boy. Yes, <laughs> Percy, old boy, absolutely. Yeah, no, and I was just reading, rereading, uh, Blood and Treasure by Don Fraser hmm. about uh, the New Mexico campaign. Oh, yeah. And I believe, and I, I can't give you names now off the top of my head, but even in that campaign, there were veterans of. Garibaldi's adventures. <laughs> so that's amazing. Yeah, there were just these guys rolling around all over the place. So even though Garibaldi may not have uh, physically been there, definitely he touched it through you know his influence through people he knew. You know his influence. Like Sir was Percy there. Wyndham. Yes. 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 <laughs> mm. um, what was I going to say? Um, but he does write a letter to Lincoln after the Emancipation Proclamation, right? And he yeah. and he says that Lincoln has done a great thing and stuff like that. Yeah. So there's still that. Yeah, and and he he definitely knows he has that celebrity, so it's right. it's nice that he uh, he offered that support there. Well, well, here's here's one. Do we still have time here for another? Oh, uh... I I have loads of time. Okay, so here's one question. Talking about we talked about this in the Soldier of Fortune episode uh, about, you know, the, the papal army and stuff like that. And they talk about how the Pope, I don't know if you've heard this one, uh, the Pope is the only uh, person to recognize the Confederacy. Yes, yes, inadvertently. Inadvertently. Cause inadvertently. The president, right? President yes. or something. <laughs> and it's really funny because... If you go into a world on fire, they yeah. always talk about how the the British Foreign Office does dance around calling Mr. Davis anything other than Mr. Davis. Yeah. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> but yeah, the, 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 the somebody at, in the Vatican accidentally or you know inadvertently uh, writes back, what, and, and what that's happens... that's been construed as recognition. Yeah, what what would happen if uh, the Pope was able, did recognize and sent a papal army over there? I don't know. I, I don't think the Pope would have would have supported no. slavery in any no, way. No, I don't think so. <laughs> as much as he disliked Garibaldi, I yeah, don't I think don't he think would have so. gone that far. No. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. But, you know, that just shows that when you get someone to write your uh, correspondence, you know, yes. you, you got to reread that you gotta stuff. You have a good secretary. You get the secretary. <laughs> so, if anybody has questions, put them down in the uh, in the comments. We still have time to do some questions. I still have battery. We're 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 talking about the Civil War. Civil um, War, untold Civil War, um, untold Civil War. Lord Rivers is doing what ifs. Yes, the what ifs. Do you have anything that we haven't talked about? Uh, man, we covered so much already. <laughs> yeah, because we, we did get to our, our elephants. We did get to Garibaldi. Yeah. Um, so, and we even got the British we, one. We've so covered Grant. We've covered, uh, let's see, Jubal Early taking Washington. Um, St. Jackson? St. Saint, Saint Jackson. Gods and Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Ivan Turchin, I don't see the question there, but he's the um, he's the uh, uh, the Russian Turchin general that comes over. Is, is a right. He's the Russian general that comes over, and I believe he was called like you know the Union Army's Cossack, um, and he kind of started the whole you know. I think he burns a town in Georgia. I think it's called Athens. I'm, yeah. You know, in the recesses of my mind. Um, so he kind of starts this whole, you know, the whole burning. Um, yeah. And he's campaign. bringing then, that, then he, that Cossack yeah. cavalry culture. Right, exactly. But Amazing. he gets in trouble for it. 
uh, yeah. when he first does it, and then he gets in trouble for it. And then he's with Sherman, and they continue doing it later in the war. So I think it's interesting yeah. that there are so many different theories on cavalry, and you know, Percy is bringing in the British, the Austrian cavalry, where he wants to close with the saber, uh, actually engage enemy infantry, um, and then uh, Fremantle writes about cavalry that it's very curious that they yeah. ride within a hundred yards of each other, dismount, and then blaze away, and then run away. Yes. Uh, well, this is common also that they wore their their sabers between the leg and oh, the saddle, right? Yeah, as if they're Instead never of... going to use them. Right, right. Like the, these, we don't know what these were once used for, but they're here. They're and here. We still yes. wear them because it <laughs> says we have to. Right. Right. But, uh, yeah, but, but yeah, no, deal. that's, it's very interesting with, uh, with um, um, the, uh, the Cossack there. Yes, yes. And I actually think he served in, uh, over there in Russia as well. He had like an experience, a military experience. From yeah, he, he was from the, he served in the Crimean War. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was, there was a lot of Cossack movement around. Um, it was definitely a constant threat in the Crimean War to the Allied armies. There were these roving, um, roving well, cavalry. You know, now we're talking. You know, what's interesting? You know what? I, I, you know, I thought about. You know, I should have said this when we were talking about if Britain got involved. You said yeah. if Britain got involved and the French came on their side, well, does the Rus do the Russians come on the Union side because they they did come over with their navy, right? For a big yeah, struggle. they. They did offer help, but I don't know how much help they can offer. It's one of the reasons why they want to get rid of Alaska is right. because they're, it's a liability. Yeah. You know, they have yeah. to sail all the way to the other side of the world in order right. to protect it. Uh, yeah. So I don't know. I, I, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. maybe. <laughs> but, well, that um, was, I, think, I do think it would be a great image. I mean, you have Cossack I, I would like riding it. behind so Oscar, great. elephants charging at yes. Gettysburg. Yes, yes. <laughs> Oh my gosh, come on. With with Don't Garibaldi me. there in the with background. Garibaldi. Just with his little blanket and his smoking yes. cap. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We need an artist <laughs> to draw that up for us. Yeah. This, Char the Civil War Custer, trailer, Custer is atop the elephant. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good. Take notes. There you go. Yeah. Take notes. Here's a great question. What if Lee accepted command of the US Army? That is a that is a, that's wow. a question. That's a question. That's a, that's and I don't know how much different he would have been from someone like McClellan, because he is a very much a textbook officer. He is. And I also wonder how he would have been with Lincoln. Because yeah, Lincoln I think he would have worked well with Lincoln. I, we love Lincoln, but he's got issues with personalities. Yeah, but Lee, Lee is not. Well with... Lee is an arrogant, like... Like yeah. uh, like McCollum, I think you would have worked yeah. great with him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I seriously well, think they would have got on. I, you know, that's what I was thinking. I think if if Lee was doing the tactical stuff and McClellan was doing the logistics stuff, yeah. I wonder if maybe see that's, that's the, the real happened. question: is would Lee and McClellan have got along? Yes, that's yeah. a good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I would would. You think Lee would have survived uh, the Washington politics? Maybe. Who knows? Who knows? But I think that's a really interesting. I, someone who knows Lee better than I would be able to yeah, answer that to, better. Yeah. But I think that's a really good uh, yeah, that counterfactual. Is yeah, that's a good counterfactual. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. We have a few other that, ones. Uh, Maybe Arlington wouldn't be covered with uh, graves today. <laughs> yeah, so. then there would at least there would be old artillery positions up there. Right. Yes. But there, yes. there, there might not be a national cemetery there. Right. <laughs> um, okay. Ivan Turchin was never in Atlanta. He was in Kentucky. Okay, so he's in Kentucky. Oh, Kentucky. Um, okay, there you go. Any other? Okay, these are all comments. What if, what if Jackson isn't killed? We covered that one. St. Jackson. We did. We did. I have Jackson. a lot of theories. Yeah. Because St. And then, then Jubal Early comes in and punches those parrots out of the way. <laughs> Just, yeah. If you have questions, leave them down here. We are taking questions. I think surviving ex-Napoleonic French veterans would be writing to Lincoln to get rid of the Cossacks. Absolutely. 
I love those which, old which photos. That? I'm sorry, I missed that one. Uh, Peninsula Wars said, I think surviving ex-Napoleonic French veterans would be writing to Lincoln to get rid of those Cossacks. Oh, yeah, yeah. That have their, <laughs> they'd be commenting about Russia. Yeah. Any other questions from people? These are all great. Good comments. I guess I can't see them on my end, I guess, because you're hosting. Oh, it. okay. Yeah. Um, Pope can't right. send over an army while dealing with Victor's Italian army. That's true. Though so the, the papal army gets called up through, uh, <laughs> you know, when they're in need, they call up uh, those volunteers. So, any other questions? Anything you've Very ever good. wondered about the Civil War? I mean, anything. Yeah, anything. <laughs> and if. I sat uh, there and went, what, hmm, what about this? Hmm. Hmm. And if I don't know, you know, I'll know someone who does know. <laughs> well, just to mention this, because I always like to mention books um, if people are interested in reading more, which I think everyone should. But the book I have here is. Again, Seizing Destiny uh, with uh, Chris Mikowski and Albert Connor. I'm actually working with uh, Chris Mikowski to do a interview about the, the topic of the book. So that's wow. why I'm reading it. And uh, so far, so good. He's been that's very awesome busy to get the classes. authors involved. But yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, um, he's been very busy with classes, but that's one of the ones coming up. Uh, some other episodes that are, are coming up, if anyone is interested, is I've got, let's see, we've got, we just finished an interview about Zoo Wahams, wow. which is going to be interesting. And we did a couple interviews about Civil War Williamsburg. Nice. Which is interesting. So, you know, most people know Colonial Williamsburg. Yeah. And so as, uh, as, my, as the expert who came on, I'll, I'll save it as a little surprise, but uh, he explains that there are more stories about the Civil War in Williamsburg than there are about George Washington. So, so I have, we have, you know, I swear I haven't planted Dan. Um, I haven't told him to uh, give me these questions, but the, it's, it's as if I've told him to give me these questions because okay. they're great. You don't think the ironclads could have broken a British blockade? No. <laughs> no. I, I want you to take a look at the size of monitor and then look at the size of warrior and the types of guns they carry. Yeah. Um, they, warrior is carrying giant, gigantic Armstrong guns. And, you know, uh, monitor has two nine inch Dahlgrens. Um, she sits low on the water. Um, warrior can fire from a long way away, you know, a long way away. I mean, not, not necessarily accurate, but it would be um, fairly accurate when it comes to an armed or a, a rifled Armstrong gun. Um, the, it would have been, it, it's just a completely different thing. One is a river monitor that's supposed to do coastal duty to move up a river they do great on the river. Um, if you go yep. to my episode on ri the river fleet, um, when they're meant to attack shore batteries along the Mississippi, they're awesome. Um, but the, they are, it would become a class of ship in the 19th century, in the late 19th century, the class of river monitors um, would be these coastal patrol ships, but they would not do well in the blue water you know, as, as it came when, when it was towed out. But Warrior is just a completely different ship. And it's not just one. There were many, there was Warrior and Black Prince, and there were many ironclads already coming out and would immediately come out as soon, uh, you know, in 1862. And it's great because we talk about this in my episode that's coming out on the anniversary of Hampton Roads in nice. March. Nice. So, so... Shameless plug for that. How effective you, is CSS? You have a video that just came out about ironclads itself. Themselves, yes, right? yes, about uh, the river ones uh, because right. we were at the Cairo. Yes. Um, how effective is CSS Hunley against a British warship? I'll say one thing: iron hull. Yeah. Because they were laying torpedoes, it would have had to have been a you know pretty hefty torpedo to blow open that iron hull. 
as opposed and, to just a wooden hull. I mean, and it's Hunley, it's, it's a one off. Even, even if there is no iron hull, I think it's good one time. Yeah, and, and <laughs> the ship has to not be moving and yeah. doing blockade duty. Maybe they would have got some hits on some smaller British ships. It definitely would have been in the Union arsenal, or in both sides' arsenals, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I don't think, again, you know, I'm not, I'm not, uh, Warrior isn't like St. Jackson, but Warrior is pretty close. Yeah, well. <laughs> well, she, if, uh, she can, she can shell New York from six miles away, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, if anyone is interested in actually learning more about the Hunley, I do have an episode on that too. Yes, so. I forgot you're the, you did the great Hunley episode. That, that was actually really fun because I got to talk to, uh, basically the, the archaeologist who's, uh, right there doing the project right now uh, as we speak you know while we sit here humbly talk hum, humbly humbly talking about uh civil war what ifs he's trying to discover why the hunley sank yeah um and, the, these are and he has he has a theory the though right you know, he does have a theory but even you can see in the interview, he's very careful. He's a, he's a real yeah, actor. yeah. He's very careful never to say this is it. He's like, well, I, you know, but the best historians are stories. careful. Yeah. They wouldn't they wouldn't do a whole hour of what ifs. No, no, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah, no. <laughs> but okay. yeah, Hunley, very interesting. Could the Monitor class ships have turret guns? They did have turret guns. They were there was one turret on the Monitor. And uh, there were actually okay. turret guns on some British ironclads that were coming out. Um, that'll be in my, my other episode. Why didn't the war go further west? Well, well, New Mexico's pretty far west. Yeah, I mean, there so is that say, attempt. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there and, was that and, attempt in New Mexico campaign, you know, Confederate Arizona. So. And there's a lot of the Calvary. fighting in Missouri that. Uh, um, Sometimes it's it's between people that are only nominally on one side or the other, like yeah. like. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't think it. I don't think it would have gone that far west. Maybe, I mean, they did station troops in Texas, expecting there to be more, more fighting out there. So, yeah. but again, the Union is all about capturing the. Um, the uh, railroads and the the rivers. Once you have those, you're you're gonna be you're gonna be good. So yes, okay. Picacho Pass. Yes. Yes. Um. That's that's the um. What's that one? The farthest west battle, right? Or yes. Yeah. Why Apaches and Sioux. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been out there too. The Comanche. Uh it was sixty two. The Royal Navy can feed New York hail rockets. Yes they can. <laughs> yes they can. Yeah. Regards from Tenerife. Oh my god, all the way out there. Hello. Talking about the Civil War in the Canary. Oh, I maybe we should mention at this point that uh there was one question I received. I want to say thank you again for, uh, you know, saying the, that they love my content and that they would assi assist me in the stock market. I did receive yes, that. Yes, they yeah. do. Yes. <laughs> they would, they would like to assist you in the stock market. I'm, I'm, I could also include my, um, my application <laughs> has been approved for the Illuminati. So, <laughs> yes. um, awesome. Yeah. Love those. Well, with my help in the stock market and your yes. you know, connections to the Illuminati. We're going to we're gonna combine sense. efforts. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Okay. Any other questions, guys? I mean, everybody everybody has had some really good questions today. So. Any, any comments? Any, uh... any comments? Just like I say on my YouTube, angry comments drive the algorithm too, so leave those. Yes. <laughs> any comments? Uh Anything, uh, hey, if you uh, saw our episode about uh, Soldiers of Fortune or, uh, you know, Britain and the Civil War, you know, we're, we're here again. So we'll be willing to answer any of those questions, too. Yes. Doesn't necessarily have to be. We will if, take your hate comments. <laughs> uh, 
All right. Well, we'll probably start wrapping up soon, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, this was a lot of fun. This yeah, was this, fun. Was, this was some a great them, episode. Unfortunately, some of them, uh, some of these questions are a little too uh, specific for me. Um, but uh, I think we covered most of them. Yeah, I think we should do another one of these soon because this was a great uh Oh, was yeah. a great discussion. So yeah. and, maybe maybe you know, we'll do regular factuals instead of counterfactuals. But right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, we'll stand up and tell people that you know the truth is. Yeah. Jackson wasn't as getting uh, wasn't at Gettysburg. That's yes. the truth. He just yes. wasn't there. And so uh, my when I when I get asked that question in person, I do always say with or without his arm. Yeah. Like how many arms? Yeah. If Jackson was a Gettysburg, okay, well, how many arms would he have? Well, yeah, you know, if we're going to, I mean. We, we Is this a two-armed straight. Jackson or a one-armed Jackson Arms, at yes. Gettysburg? So. <laughs> right. Well, we could do uh, common misconceptions or something. Oh, you know me. Trying to break <laughs> those misconceptions. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh. The monuments were not there when the battle was fought. That's another really? one at Gettysburg. So I've always cool. wondered why there's no holes in them. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're in, uh, if there was really a big battle fought here, why aren't there holes in the monuments? Yeah, exactly. The fools. Well, I'll tell you, ancient aliens. So. Yes, that's how those monuments got there. <laughs> I, I have perused some turtle dove. Have you guys read any Harry Turtle Dove? Well, Harry I, I've, turtle I've done a little bit of Turtle Dove. Um, I, I'm not not too big of a fan. I, I did get into um, back in the day. It was called Stars and Stripes Forever, and I don't remember what the author was, but it was this. It, it was basically that the war started during the Trent Affair, and then something happened where the Union and the Confederacy combined to fight uh, the British. Oh, wow. And I love the cover of it because it's HMS Warrior fighting the CSS Virginia and the Monitor. (laughs) So cool. Even though though it's like they're like right up next to each other. So it wouldn't have been like that. But I do love that. um, Who did the book? It was... One again, I think Britain gets involved in the Civil War, but one of the main characters is Winfield Scott. Like he's a constant throughout the um, see, whole book. He has a whole series on this topic. Cover cover photo is Ironclad shelling London. Yeah, see that wouldn't have happened. An American Ironclad. I mean, the, you can't even fire. You can't even elevate the guns inside the uh, uh, monitor very much. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 true that American ironclad technology was very far behind. I mean, even the Italians, the yeah. Italians are coming out with, uh, I mean, the British are building them for them, but they're, they're ironclad ocean going vessels. And that's, uh, that's, that's one of the great points in our other episode that's coming out is uh, if the Italians have ironclads, you're probably not the first then. Yeah. You well, know? no, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. This was a great episode, and I uh, thank you for everyone who is chiming in because it was uh, it was a good discussion all around. Yeah, I think we got some. It was a lot of fun. I like doing this. I know a lot of people, despite what historians tell ourselves, you know, yes, we do kind of like to sit down and do the what ifs. Yeah. So this is a good time. All right. Thanks everyone for joining us, and we will be signing off. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you so much.